All right, so um, my name's Craig Aspinall. This is actually my third time presenting at OSDC, and this will be the ninth programming language that I've uh, presented on. Um, unlike most of the others, this one I am actually starting to use. This one I'm having a full-on relationship with as opposed to just an affair. So um, who's, who's looked at Go before? Has anybody kind of played around with Go? Oh, a few people. OK, who knows who Murray Walker is? Like three people. So Murray Walker is this legendary uh, motorsport commentator, and he's legendary because he did it for an awfully long time, but also because he famously makes lots of gaffes. He screws things up, tells you that people are in the wrong place, are in the pits when they're not, and all that kind of thing. So this presentation is probably a little bit Murray Walker inspired, as in I'm, it's a new relationship. I'm likely to be very enthusiastic, but I'll probably not be entirely accurate. I'll do my best. Um, let me just get rid of that Griffith warning. Um, so my background, um, I spent about eight years being a Java developer, but not your typical Java developer. I did things with Java that nobody in their right mind would choose to do, um, as in desktop, multimedia, high performance, video and audio streaming uh, across lots of different platforms and lots of different CPU architectures, which mean doing lots of C and Java intercommunication, which kind of throws the few good bits of Java out of the window. So things like garbage collection and um, you know, it's memory management and type safety and all that just disappears and you blow it up in spectacular fashion. So that was awesome. Um, now I'm actually a founder at a startup, which means I lead a, a bit of a double life. Um, so by day, I work at Literacy Planet, which is a Gold Coast based company that's been around for a few years. They produce a, a Literacy Planet is an online uh, learning platform for children to learn English literature. It's popular in Australia. It's growing into the, into the UK. It's also popular in places like Malaysia as well. Um, so we have a small team here at Varsity Lakes. Um, so during the day now, I do Ruby on Rails development predominantly with these guys. Uh, and then by night, um, on weekend and just about every other waking moment, I work on my own startup, which is called Bags Up, which is a, uh, a travel startup. And basically what we do is you say, hey, I want to go to the Philippines. And we say, OK, you want to stay in this hotel and you want to eat in that restaurant because they do awesome Kung Pao chicken. And we know that you love Kung Pao chicken and you need to go and see these experiences. And you don't have to do any of the searching through TripAdvisor and Yelp and deal with hundreds of, uh, hundreds of different reviews across dozens of different sites. And this is where we're using Go. So partly I'm going to talk about why did I choose Go, but um, we're going to look at why Google chose Go, as soon as they created it in the first place. Um, and I'll do a little bit of an introduction to some of the things that I think are important about the language. So if we start off with, um, with Google, this quote is taken from Rob Pike from an, uh, an essay and a presentation he did called uh, Language Design in the Service of Software Engineering, which is a really interesting paper if you're interested in the background to go. But this is quite telling. In short, software development at Google is big, can be slow, and is often clumsy, but it is effective. So if you think about the three languages that Google predominantly used, at least before um, Go came along, they use C++, Java, and Python. So you can kind of decide which of those adjectives applies to which of those languages, depending on which ones you particularly love or hate. Um, they tended to use C++ in the areas where performance was absolutely critical, and Java just basically wouldn't cut it. They couldn't get the JVM to perform. They wanted to go down to bare metal and do strange and wonderful things to get extra performance out of that. That's what they would do. But unfortunately, you know, with C and C++, you do get the the, uh, the opportunity to blow your own toes off, which, you know, and you can create unmaintainable nightmares out of it. So they use C++, and that's probably some of those areas where things might have been a bit clumsy. Um, Java, I think they probably use more as a, a sort of safer alternative to C++ and Python. You know, we've got memory management issues largely go away. You've got to deal with garbage collection tuning, but um, you don't tend to get the same issues. You've got no uh, pointer arithmetic. You've got static type checking. But you have to deal with all of the Java boilerplate. Right? It's not the nicest uh, development environment to work in. Um, Python's great for quickly hacking things together. It's typical you know, dynamic language. Um, very high productivity. So this will put the slide up of the, the sweatshop. And you can crank lots of stuff out very, very quickly. But occasionally, you end up injuring yourselves at runtime or injuring someone else at runtime when things that you assumed were going to work, the dynamic typing catches you out. And you go, ah, oh, damn, that's not actually what I thought it was. And you get some random error. Um, so why did we choose Go for bags up? Uh, personally, I'm more of a statically typed language person. So Ruby, Python, JavaScript, and Node, Rails, Django, et cetera, um, 
or Twisted and the lighter weight frameworks were all kind of out from the day one. Um, we did consider Java, it's because it's you know, familiar, but it's also boring. I um, was really tempted to go with Haskell. Uh, the biggest problem was getting other people to buy into Haskell and getting them up to speed with things when you've crafted this wonderful uh, piece of code that nobody else can actually understand. Um, and we looked at Rust, which is really interesting, but it's still a bit too immature. So that kind of led us to, to go. But the main reason we actually chose it is because all these cool kids were already using it. And we thought, that's awesome. We're doing an internet startup. We should go and use this as well, right? And what better idea? So, and we use a bunch of these products. And we're actually basing a lot of our architecture on CoreOS and Docker. So it's like, well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. And if we drop our logo in there, it looks right at home with all these guys. We thought, that's it. This is magic. We've got to go with Go, right? So that's very nice. But real, there are some really good technical and practical reasons, honest. Um, one, two of the things I was really looking for were readability and testability. So the nature of Bags Up is that when we start to grow, we, if we go well, we'll hit an exponential growth curve. And we're going to have to bring a lot of people in very quickly and get them up to speed and stop them from screwing things up. So having a code base that is readable uh, and testable um, was really important to us. And Go was written mostly for reading. It's one of the things that the language designers were very adamant about. It's not just about the writing, it's about the reading. How easy it is, is it to decipher what the code is actually doing? Um, the other thing is flexibility. So I certainly can't do that. But we also need to be nimble. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know which parts of the system are going to need scaling. Um, we don't know necessarily where the direction is going to take us. We may end up with some major pivots along the way. So we wanted something that would keep us nimble on our feet. Um, and we're looking for an architecture that would give us that flexibility as well as a development environment. And everything around Go seemed to just fit nicely. So I'm going to take, go through kind of three things that I think may Go a, a good fit for us. Um, so they're only talking about three of the language features, but the three that most people, if you've done anything with Go or you've heard anything about Go, you probably will have come across these and not necessarily dug into them in too much depth. So number one, interfaces. Who's familiar with Java interfaces? A few people. So Go interfaces are similar but different. Um, can't have a developer conference without unreadable code on a slide. So what we've got up here. Um, is a file with a, a package called duck and an interface called quacker. And interfaces in Go basically are just collections of function definitions or method calls. So it defines a method called quack that takes no arguments and returns a string. That's simple, right? Over here, we have another file called platypus, which imports fumpt, which is the one, one of the few things that really bugs me about Go is that they've decided to really abbreviate things. So that's short for format. So it's just doing your string formatting. Um, we have a type called platypus, which is just defined as a string. So you can take the built-in types and go and give them other names so they can be more meaningful for you. And then we have this sort of slightly weird-looking function definition, which is actually a method. So what we're saying is this thing here in the parentheses is the receiver. So a platypus can receive a quack method, and it will return a string. And basically, it prints out whatever the string value of itself is. So whatever we put in here, and I'm quackers. So it's just like a... C sprint F. So I've called this static duct typing because this thing up here has no reference to this, and this thing up here has no reference to that, but this implements that implicitly because it has a quack method. And anything that has a quack method with a signature like that automatically implements this interface. So anywhere, anywhere where we reference quacker, we can pass in a platypus because it happens to have a bill. So, and here is an example of that actually happening. So, this is a, an actual Go program. We import the duck and the platypus um, uh, packages and the fumpt package again. Create a method called does it quack that takes a quacker from the package duck. And you have to dereference, um, you have to namespace your uh, types and uh, function calls with the package name in Go so everything's really clear. Um, and then we print out whatever the quack method returns. And then in the actual main functions, this uh, bootstrap uh, function, we create a platypus called Paul, and we pass it to does it quack? And it prints out, I'm Paul and I'm quackers. It's quite happy. If we passed anything else in here that didn't implement quack, it would break at compile time. 
unlike a dynamic, like, dynamic duct typing. I'm kind of drawing, they might not technically be the same thing, but you can use them in a very similar way. Just this saves you from accidentally blowing yourself up at runtime. So this is really good. The, um, the other thing that's really nice about interfaces is they make testing really easy. So it's very idiomatic in Go to define everything with interfaces, and then you can pass whatever you want in there. So mocking things out, super easy. Um, you can also kind of almost retrofit interfaces to things. So if you've got a structure that has a bunch of methods on it and you want to be able to do something or provide an alternative to that at some point, you can define an interface that looks like whatever that uh, object's method signatures look like and pass that around instead, and then you can swap them in and out. Um, so that's kind of, of neat. So interfaces are really good. They, they keep all of your code nicely decoupled. So that's one thing that I really like about it. Uh, number two, channels. So I'm going to talk about this, and I'm going to talk about Go routines, and they're kind of connected. So I'll cover a bit of each uh, at, almost at the same time. But channels are basically um, pipes between which two processes can communicate. So Go has this mantra of don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. All right, they try and invert it, flip it on its head. And if you're familiar with Unix pipes, it's a, similar, it's a very similar concept. And a lot of the things in Go are very Unixy in that sense. Um, so a, a, a channel basically is unbuffered by default, which means it synchronizes two processes together. You can put buffering in there if you want. But nominally, when you create a channel, you're waiting for a writer at one end and a reader at the other end to both be ready. So the writer has to be ready to write. The reader has to be ready to read. When that happens, the value goes through the pipe. And both of them can be unblocked and carry on doing whatever they were doing. All right. So this is a really simple example. Um, this is actually my solution to one of the EULA, pro, uh, EULA challenges. So the idea of this program is you sum the even Fibonacci terms below 4 million, um, which you don't want to calculate by hand, obviously. Um, so same stuff, sort of stuff here. We've got a, a constant definition, which just defines what the maximum term is. We have the sum here. So Go uses implicit typing as well. So if you're assigning a value or initializing a variable with the value, you don't have to tell it the type. It can work it out from whatever you're assigning to it. But once it's assigned, it keeps that type. Um, we create a channel of integers. So channels are typed as well. So you can only send integers through this particular channel. And we assign that to a variable called Fibonacci. And then we launch this Go routine. And I'll talk more about Go routines on the next couple of slides. So I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. But it's basically saying, hey, go call this function and pass it in the Fibonacci uh, channel. The function is defined down here. So here we can see it receiving the channel. And basically what it does, this looks a little bit odd because it's using multiple assignment. So other languages have this as well. It's not specifically a Go thing. But basically we're saying i is initialized with the value 1, j is initialized with the value 2. So we can assign two values to two different variables at the same time. And we can actually update them as the loop goes round. So i will take the value j, and j will take the value i plus j every time we go around the loop. So, so it's going to update. So the nice thing about this is we don't have to do any temporary variables where we copy things around. We just do it all in that one line, and it keeps it out of the way. So it might look a little bit odd when you first look at it, but over time, it actually becomes a lot clearer what's going on. And then it just pushes the value i to the channel out. It says, hey, go over there. And at that point, it'll block. And you go, ah, I'm waiting for a reader. So this loop stops. And if we come back up to the main program here, this is basically draining that channel out. So this, this is how we read out of a channel. and saying, hey, go put the value out of this channel into f. And then whilst f is less than the limit, just keep reading or updating f. So at this point, when this one reaches here and this one reaches there, the two will sync up. The value will cross over. We'll get f out here. We can go and check to see whether it's even and add it to the sum and so on. But every time, these two things can be going in parallel. Or they are going concurrently. They will go in parallel if you have multiple CPU cores. So you can actually have two things happening at the same time, as opposed to just being synchronized. If you're single core, then they will not happen at exactly the same time, but they will be controlled. And that's it. So you've got multi-core support with a couple of lines. So the secret is in this Go keyword, which tells it to go and launch a, a, a Go routine. So speaking of Go routines, um, so Go routines, you can think of them, for the purpose of that for previous slide, you could have thought of it as just a thread. But Go routines are really, really lightweight. And 
it is not uncommon for there to be millions of Go routines coexisting in a live system. It's quite normal for that to happen. They're cheap enough that you can just create them all and go, hey, whatever, right? So I went, yeah, OK, whatever, right, let's actually try it. So here it is, right? I've broken this just into three bits so we can fit it all on the slide. But here's our main program. So we start a timer. We start a bunch of Go routines, which returns us a channel. So this sync is a channel. We then go and drain those Go routines out of that channel. Um, and basically, each time we'll see down here, they just spit the value one through so we can count them, make sure they all finish. We close the timer off and print out how long it took. OK, yeah, all right, then there's the limit. So we've got a million Go routines up here. So here's the start Go routine. So it returns a channel of integer. So we go and create that channel. And then we basically loop a million times. And we go and create a million mad Go routines, because it's kind of a mad thing to do for no reason. So we pass in the sync channel. And then each of these Go routines basically sleeps for a second and then spits the value out. So if we were to run this, and it was going to run completely sequentially, we we're going to be sat here for a very long time, which we're not going to do. So that's basically how we start it. And then the drain go routines just takes the channel that was created over here, basically creates a sum variable, goes through, keeps reading out of the sync channel until we reach the limit, and then returns whatever the value was. So ideally, we should, if this terminates, we'll get a million out, right? Um, and then we just print out how long it took in terms of seconds. So. This runs absolutely no problem whatsoever on this old MacBook Air that I'm giving, I've got here. And it terminates in, anyone want to hazard a guess how long it takes? How long? 1.1. No, not quite that quick. But it's mostly the I.O. overhead that it takes. So it's all the moving stuff around. So it takes 73 seconds. 73, 73 seconds. So it's still a lot better than 1,000, but it'll just show that everything, all these things are basically waiting for that second. And then it takes the rest of the time to do it well. The time to create the Go routines, that's actually included in there as well, but then the time to drain them off. But it does show that everything is happening concurrently. We're just waiting for the I.O. to all go through. So it does, and it does it with no problems. The CPU doesn't go nuts. Nothing weird happens. It just sits there, waits, spits the value out. So it's fine. And like I say, there are running systems that have millions of, uh, of Go routines running with no problem whatsoever. What's the problem if you want to debug them, but it's a different matter. Um, so as I said, this is kind of a Murray Walker inspired presentation, so I can't count just like he can't. Um, so the fourth thing out of the three things that I really like about Go is the tooling, because it's very much a batteries included environment. So, you know, lots of these things exist for other environments, but typically you have to go to a third party tool, right? So you want to do source code formatting, you've got to go to CheckStyle for Java or RuboCop for Ruby or whatever. Um, you want to do testing, well, that's got to be a J unit or X unit or, um, you know, R spec or something else. Um, you want to build, well, okay, that's usually built in, that's fine. You want to install stuff, well, it can do that as well. So this is essentially make. Uh, you want to just run it, then you can just point it at a Go file and it will run it, very similar to how a dynamic uh, Python script or Ruby script would be, get run. Um, you know where some code is, where a particular library is, or a particular tool is? You just say, go get it. Say, hey, go get github.com slash aspinall slash osd2014, and it will go and install that into your GoPath for you. And it knows how to do that, which is kind of cool. So getting stuff is really simple. Um, it's got a built-in linter. So it'll go and check, based on a whole bunch of heuristics that the guys at Google have figured out, what might be wrong with your code that's not immediately obvious, that's not causing you know, the bad pattern static analysis type stuff. Um, and I suspect this is very much for the Go guys internally. Uh, there's a Go fix, which is kind of cool. So that basically goes off and looks at your code and says, oh, that's using old versions of the API. We'll just rewrite that for you so we work with the new versions of the API. So you don't have to go and do it yourself. So it refactors your code for you to match new API versions. So it's all pretty. Um, pretty good. There are a couple of things you, you might want to go out. There's some dependency management stuff. There's a third-party tool that's really good for. There's some automatic uh, sort of live reload testing type stuff that's really good as well. Um, but for the most part, you can pretty much do what you want with it. And it, it, it's not the kind of thing you really need an editor for. You just bang it into Vim or Sublime or whatever your particular IDE or, um, or your particular text editor of choices and just start hacking away. So 
Uh, I did rush through that fairly quickly because I know we're short on time, but um, I really like Go. We're still early, very early in our journey on it, so I'm by no means an expert. Um, I actually like it because it's boring, which might sound kind of weird, but it's boring for all the right reasons, right? It's boring because it just works. It gets out of the way and allows you to get on and do stuff and then doesn't come back yet and bite you in the ass later for doing that, um, unlike some other environments. And there are lots of people moving over from Ruby, JavaScript, um, Java uh, to, to Go. There's lots of public defections. There's lots of uh, very high profile uses of it as well, above and beyond what I've put on the slide. There's also lots of people hating on it um, for not pushing language design boundaries. Like, well, why haven't you got, it doesn't have generics. Right? There's no polymorphic type. Well, there are polymorphic types, but only on the built-in things. So channels are polymorphic, but you can't create your own polymorphic type. People go, well, it's rubbish. We've had that for ages, since Java 5. You know, it's been everywhere. And I was like, well, yeah, do you really need it? So far, no, I haven't. You know, I've been able to get away with the built-in slices, which are effectively vectors or global arrays, um, channels and maps. You can use the ones that are built in. If you really need to create your own, it's not that difficult to make a type that does those things for you. It doesn't need to be polymorphic. Um, if you are interested in learning a bit more, the golang.org website is an amazing resource. If you haven't done it, the first thing to do, there's a tour on there which you can do in the browser. You can run all the code and it tells you whether you're getting things right or wrong. That's a really great 25 minute, 30 minute introduction. Covers pretty much the whole language. And it's really easy to learn. You know, this, the, the learning curve is really shallow. Unlike Haskell, the errors that the compiler gives you are actually decipherable. It says, hey, you screwed up, that's wrong, go fix it. As opposed to Haskell, which goes, you did something stupid and you have to work out how that, what that was from this weird message that I gave you. Um, so it's, you know, I encourage you to go and have a look at it. If you've got any questions and we have time, I'm happy to take them. If not, you can grab me in any of those places. Just say one. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, I knew I was going to draw some. A couple, <laughs> there's a Uh, depend, so buy-in from, from me personally, or buy-in? Well, because you mentioned earlier that you, something tantamount to you couldn't get buy-in for Haskell, but you wanted to use Haskell. Yeah, so I mean, I'm a big fan of, like, I don't know Haskell very well, but I like what I do know about it. Um, it's from a purist, not necessarily in the, the functional point of view, but just from a language point of view. I think it's an awesome language, and I enjoy every time I play with it. I find it incredibly frustrating and incredibly rewarding. Um, like I said, one of the issues for me thinking about bags up from a, a CTO perspective is, like I say, we're kind of expecting when, if, if and when we hit uh, the mainstream that the growth will be big, like there'll be a lot of money thrown at this thing and it will, we'll have to recruit a lot of people. And there just aren't that many um, good Haskell developers ready to step in and pick that up. And growing them internally is not straightforward. Um, so. It's more, a fact, it's, more a fact, uh, uh, it's more that there's not enough good people who know Haskell already around, and we don't have the time to grow them internally. That was the swaying factor. This is easy. It gives us most of what we want. Um, it's not as, as nice and neat as Haskell, but it'll do the job. So does that answer the question? Yes. Cool. Yep. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yes, uh, no? so just on the vibe of that question. Um, yep. Have you recently avoided any, uh, do you train in-house or are you... So I ha I'm, I've been responsible for recruiting developers for about the last 15 years in various organisations, both here and in the UK. Um, so I've got a lot of experience of what's around. Um, unfortunately, like you guys probably represent less than 1% of the developer population who actually give a crap about what they do, right? 99% of people don't and they won't come to conferences like this and they won't explore new languages and trying to convince them to do anything different is really hard. So when you're looking for those 1% that Google and Facebook and the big guys haven't already got, it is really difficult. And you can get the next 10% and they're good and they will do a great job for you, but it's really hard. And 
you can get people who come from a Java or a Ruby background and get them, I think, it's an easier transition to get them over to Go than it is to get them over to Haskell. So without making mistakes that cause us more grief down the line. So it's, it's a practicality issue. In an ideal world, I'd love, I think everybody should be taught Haskell as the teaching language, and then we'd have much better developers all around. Um, but it's just practicality of it doesn't work for us. Thanks, Craig. All right.